Now, here's an interesting scenario, and this was a case that we actually handled, and you really had to apply the, the but for question. Um, there was uh, our, our client who was driving down the road, and um, her BAC was not very high, but she was over the legal limit, and she ran into the, the cement barrier in the middle of the freeway and kind of bounced a little bit over to the right, um, lost control of her vehicle and went off the side of the road. And there happened to be a truck sitting in a stop sign with a gas line over here in the grass. And our client ran into the truck, pushed the truck into the unprotected gas line and it burst into flames and there was a death involved of the victim sitting in the truck. Terrible set of facts, um, very egregious. These cases can be difficult to work on sometimes, but you still have to go back and look at the two-part analysis. Um, on re upon research online, there, there are thousands and thousands of unprotected gas lines around the country. Um, but was that unprotected gas line the cause of the death? So part one, was the gas line being unprotected and too close to the road clearly sufficient to cause the death of the person driving the other car that the defendant ran into and pushed into the gas line? The answer to that is no. Just because there's a gas line there, that was not clearly sufficient to cause the death. If um, the person had not run into that truck and pushed them into the gas line, it never would have come into play. So the part two was the defendant's action of driving while intoxicated clearly insufficient to cause the gas line to burst into flames, causing the death of the other driver? Um, the answer to that is no. As a matter of fact, the answer is most likely probably yes all the time, that their actions were sufficient to cause the gas line to burst into flames. So this wasn't um, a great set of facts, but it's interesting to note that there was a civil lawsuit against the city um, about this unprotected gas line. So there was some concurrent causation that, you know, if the gas line wasn't there or if it was protected, would this have occurred? Um, but I think under the two-part analysis, the, it, when you do it this way and you have to answer yes or no, it's much easier to analyze. So this case did not go to trial. We, um, the person was an older, older person who had a perfectly clean record and worked very hard, um, had a good job their whole life. And we pled to the court um, and received probation for, for this. It was a tragic accident. Um, the person still had to serve 120 days in jail, um, but obtaining probation on a case like this is a, is a big success for most defense attorneys and for most defendants. <clears throat> now, this is another case that we dealt with, and that's what we're going to focus on the rest of this time. Um, here's an actual picture of an accident that could not have been avoided. This is an intoxication manslaughter where our client was driving the um, it was a rental or a loaner Cadillac SUV on the left and was going down um, the freeway uh, in Texas on I-10 at night and ran into the back of a motorcycle and um, killed the driver of the motorcycle. He went to the hospital, but he ended up dying about a day and a half later. It ended up being um, an accident. That, and we showed by all of our extensive investigation, just sometimes there are accidents that nobody can avoid. And under the two-part analysis, um, we were able to convince the state and the state's investigation team that this really was just what we said. It was an accident that nobody could have avoided and they um, dropped it down from a felony intoxication manslaughter. They said, this is just not an intoxication manslaughter because the the causation is weak, the causation is not there. Um, and they had trouble proving that the defendant was even driving while intoxicated, but let's go into that. So the analysis, if we do that two-part question, was the malfunctioning, so th th here are some of the facts. Was, was the malfunctioning blacked out motorcycle, meaning it had black covers over the tail lights, uh, driving 17 miles an hour, that was determined from um, 
the state's investigation team, anywhere from 17 to I think 29 miles an hour. Our accident reconstruction team said it was 17 miles an hour that this motorcycle was traveling at night in the dark on an unlighted section of I-10 wearing all black and a blacked out bike that was malfunctioning, going very slowly in the fast lane of the freeway. Um, was that clearly sufficient to cause the defendant to run into him causing his death? I mean, I don't know if it's clearly sufficient, but certainly it's a very strong argument that all of those factors combined in this case, in this intoxication manslaughter, could anybody have avoided running into that motorcycle? He was in a place where he shouldn't have been. And again, we're, these are egregious cases and we're not unsympathetic to the fact that there is a fatality involved. This was a nice young man um, who was on a motorcycle that he didn't have a license to drive that was borrowed from somebody else that he was told not to drive it, that it had zip ties holding on some of the parts. Um, but shouldn't have been out there at that time. So the part one analysis is much stronger in this case. Part two was the defendant's action of driving while intoxicated clearly insufficient to cause the, the crash into the motorcycle causing the death of the rider. Again, I think this is harder to tell. It may be yes, it may be no, but you have a much stronger argument for yes, that, you know, the word clearly is difficult to, to deal with, but um, the actions of the person driving while intoxicated, if that bike hadn't been there in that condition, just our client driving down the road, um, I mean, he is the one that ran into the motorcycle, but it's not, the causation issue is there, and, and you really have to, to ask yourself, was, was it clearly insufficient? It may be clearly insufficient. Um, because nothing about him driving while intoxicated um, would, it, if he was driving not intoxicated, which I don't think they even proved intoxication, he might not have been able to avoid the crash in any condition or anybody. Even a police officer driving down the road who is completely sober may not have been able to avoid this accident at all. So in that case, and in this case, it could be clearly insufficient. Um, and their driving while intoxicated might not be the cause of this at all. 